But I think to be a good mechanic, you, you, you know, the, the, the old saying, a mechanic in panic is not a mechanic. So you, you can't panic. You've got, to, you've got to get through what has to be done. There are times when you are under extreme pressure, but you can't shortcut. You have to make sure that the machine is safe. G'day, and welcome back to Real Risk, the adventure podcast. Now, for those who enjoy video podcasts, I've engaged with Podbooth here in Adelaide to produce the show, and I'm really excited about how it's going to work. For those who listen in the car or on your daily walk, the audio files, of course, will still be available. My name's Richard Harris, and you might remember me from my involvement in the 2018 Thai Cave Rescue. Well, that adventure has led to many other exciting opportunities, including the chance to chat with like-minded adventurers and risk-takers on this podcast. There's lots of exciting things to announce over the course of the season, and plenty of brilliant, daring, adventurous and thoughtful guests already lined up. There'll be more extreme athletes, more divers, more soldiers. More people who get off on going fast, climbing high or challenging themselves in ways most of us can't even dream of. And all of them will talk to us about why they think the benefits outweigh the dangers. Why risk is integral to making us stronger, more resilient and better able to cope with the stresses of daily life. And let's face it, when has that ever been more important? G'day and welcome back to Real Risk. I'm Richard Harris and today of course I have another great show with another fascinating guest. Now, I'm not going to deny it, we have been a little heavy on underwater adventurers and petrol heads this season. I guess that reflects to some degree my own interests, but I hope it's been of interest to you as well. If you want something completely different, make sure you send your guest requests via the website at realriskpodcast.com. Many of the guests on the show have already been based on your suggestions, so I'm always happy to accommodate. Today, we're back on the racetrack, more specifically behind the scenes of the Motorcycle Grand Prix or MotoGP. At this level, every rider has a massive team behind them. And one of the most important people in the team is the crew chief, whose job it is to turn the rider's feedback into improved outcomes on the racetrack, to set up the bike properly, to manage the pit crew, even to be a psychologist to the rider. And one of the best in the business, crew chief for three world champions and many other big names in the sport, is a local guy called Jeremy Burgess. And what's the chances? JB, as he's known, lives just near me in the Adelaide Hills. So I hope you enjoy this rare insight into the world of MotoGP. Jeremy Burgess, thank you very much for joining me. A pleasure to be here, Richard. Now, you probably don't know a lot about my motorsport career, but um, I'm really hitting my straps at the moment in my 1964 uh, Cooper S Mini racing in historic touring cars. And I have my own uh, crew chief, who I believe you know, uh, an old mate of ours called Alan Austin. (laughs) <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, Ellen and I haven't seen each other for, I'm going to say, 40 years. But uh, in the, when I was involved in the bike racing scene here in South Australia in the 70s, we were very much in the same group. And I think you've got somebody fairly capable there and good to see your own good British machinery. Oh, absolutely. And I'm uh, about to also uh, acquire the Mark One Escort as well, so for the stable. So, you know, my motor racing career is really, really going ahead. But Alan did tell me a funny story about you from the, I think it was from the 70s, would that be right? Racing down at uh, McNamara Park at Mount Gambier. Absolutely, it'd be the 70s. Yeah. And um, he said that one night you and him and some other uh, lads had a bit of a night at the pub, I believe, in Mount Gambier. And the next day, uh, you came out of the caravan, sat on the motorbike, which was a bit of a big beast, and uh, fired it up, ran it for about 20 seconds, switched it off and walked back into the caravan and went back to bed. Does that ring any bells? <laughs> Look, it must have been a good night at the pub, as I can't remember that. <laughs> but the target always was to leave work here at sort of five in the afternoon and make the Jens Hotel in Mount Gambier on the Friday night before that closed, and that had a long licence uh, so we all caught up there and then uh, trundled off to our various motels or slept in our panel vans, which was pretty right. much what we did, and took on the racing in a, over the next couple of days. So that's the early days for you, I guess. I gather you grew up on, on a farm and were tinkering with mechanical things from an early early age. Yeah, we. we uh, my father was uh, worked for the ABC and was probably one of the first uh, hobby farmers. We took over an old dairy farming property in the Adelaide Hills at Allgate in the early 1950s. And there was machinery lying around and a drilling company up the road. So there was always plenty of stuff to tinker with. My father thought it uh, was a generational jump from 
my great great uncles who were David and John Shearer from Shearer Farm Machinery who built the the steam car back in the early 1900s but I'm not so sure so I, just, a, I, I just like mucking around with mechanical things and I remember somebody saying if you don't know how it works you'll never be able to fix it so that has always intrigued me so it sounds like there's a bit of engine oil in the blood <laughs> <laughs> yeah and if it's got an engine I'm I'll be looking at it for sure I I find engines a, a thing of great beauty and, and understanding how they work and uh, in the more modern times with uh, the metallurgy, the tolerances and the, the way they've developed, you know, it'd be very hard not to be interested in them from anywhere in, in, in life, I think. Did you train as a mechanic? No, I never did. I, I uh, started driving when I was eight and I had my first car when I was 12 uh, it cost me £12.10 and my father allowed me to purchase it because he felt that it would be tinkered with, taken apart and would never run again. He he didn't realise that it would be tearing up his paddocks within a very short time and that his FC Holden Ute would be milked for petrol. <laughs> well, what sort of car was it? It was a Ford Anglia. Oh, nice. Uh, nice. Yeah, very... Uh, sought after little vehicle these days. Well, they, they're they quite competitive at Goodwood uh, Speed Week in England, I think, the Anglias. Yes, the 105E would be. This was the early uh, boxy section, uh, one that used to come to Australia from England in in big wooden crates and be assembled here in Australia. The, the Prefect, the Popular and the Anglia were all of that, that vein, as were the Austins, A40s and what have you. But, um, yeah, it just, you know, I guess that was the seed mucking around with that. And uh, the motorbike thing started, of course, um, when I got a job as a, as a means of transport to work because it was rather expensive to run a car. What was your first motorcycle? My first motorcycle for the road w- was a T500 Suzuki Cobra, mm. which I purchased uh, secondhand a year old from Hamish Cornell, who was the son or part of the Cornell dynasty that was Cornell Suzuki back here in the, the importers of the Suzuki motorcycles in the in the, the uh, 60s. So that's a pretty big ride for your first road bike. Yes, to be fair, it, it was probably not the ideal start, but it didn't, didn't hurt me. Uh, um, something smaller would have probably been a little less stressful, but on the other hand, after sort of a few months, you're sort of understanding of what you had. Well, you either perish or you thrive, I think, <laughs> in that sort of situation. So luckily you thrived. Yes. And of course, um, you know, there was a lot of blokes around with bikes the same size with a lot more experience at the time. So I certainly knew where I stood. I, I was cautious. You know. Yeah. And when did the racing start? What drew you to that? The racing started by just going out to Adelaide International Raceway, as was in those days, and, and watching the bike racing and the car racing as I was a, you know, a bit of a petrol head. But like anything, you, you, you start with a bike, you, you meet people of like mind and, and then you sort of work in a group. Then somewhere along the line, one of the group had a friend who was a, a racer. So I remember going to Mount Gambia to watch the racing with him. And he took me along, uh, sort of kept my interest. And I, I remember going to Virginia and watching the racing there and the Kawasaki 750 Mac 4 had just come out and that was a pretty, uh, the fastest thing around at the time. $1,473 would buy you one. So wow. I went and bought one and then hooked up with some guys who were racing at the time and, and they invited me out to the racetrack one Saturday, pay you $20, sign the indemnity and and go out for as long as you like. And I worked out I wasn't, I was quicker than some of those guys there and they were already racing. So I thought, well, I'm not going to come last. I'll enter a race. Well, on December the 10th, 1972, I entered my first race and uh, put myself in the Adelaide Hospital uh, with a skin graft to the back of my wrist. <laughs> <laughs> First of many? Uh, only one, fortunately. Recovered from that and came back in March of 73 and finished third in the what was then the prestigious ad- advertiser three-hour production race. So 
going for three hours and not knowing where you were in the race and finding out at the end of the race you'd finished third against riders from interstate and all over Australia sort of uh, made me think maybe I'm all right at this. And uh, so the enjoyment was was there, the seed was sown, and uh, from that point on I, I raced uh, wherever I could and whenever I could. And had it occurred to you that you could do that for a living at that stage? Oh, that would have been the dream, but that was only in the magazines. Uh, I don't think there was anybody in Australia who could really say they were professional. They got a lot of help from motorcycle importers, motorcycle dealers, men of wealth who who were keen to put good riders on their bikes so that alleviated the cost of purchase for a lot of these guys. But most of them would have had uh, jobs through the week or did something else. But, you know, the, the, the Hansfords and the Willings and people like that who would then go and contest international races in in America or in, in Asia or in Japan, they were sort of on, a, on another level. There was a grading system you had to go through from sort of C grade where you start to B grade to, to A grade and uh, I got through to A grade. I, I raced all over Australia. <clears throat> But to be fair, it was probably better as a B-grade rider because you could enter more races. You weren't sort of limited to the three or four A-grade races for the week. You could, as a B-grader, you could enter all the B-grade races and would generally get accepted for the A-grade races to make up the field. So your chance of making more prize money was was greater. So to be in A-grade, you, you pretty much knew you were gonna, where you were going to finish every race. Um, and is this, is this the 1970s? Yeah, this is 70, sort of 74 through to 79. Yep. And at what point did you just decide you'd go to Europe to see what, what, what the action over there was like? Basically, our parents, my parents had always encouraged the family to travel. They'd, they'd travelled and, and uh, every Aussie was really doing that in those days, was going to Europe for the six weeks or whatever and then coming back and settling down and getting on with the rest of their lives. I uh, made the decision, I think, sometime in the end of 79. I never retired from racing. I just stopped doing it. I sold my bikes because my father, in his wisdom, said when you get back, they'll be a year old, and then they're older, so they'll be a two-year-old bike you'll be trying to sell. So I cleaned up all of that and set off for Europe with uh, another great South Australian, Greg Pretty, who had been won a lot of races and in Australia in 79. And, uh, he's actually a, a Sportsman of the Year in the South Australian Hall of Fame Sportsman for that year. So Greg and I went over together with no real sort of commitments to, to work with Greg. Uh, he wanted to race in England and do some things. I got into England and um, was staying with a, a friend of mine who I, I knew over there who was a mechanic for another rider who was already in Europe. And to cut a long story short, he sort of indicated they were looking for a mechanic to work at Suzuki Great Britain. And I said, put my name down with the other 500. They called me in for the interview. They knew that I'd run bikes in Australia. My bikes were good, reliable. And uh, I got the job. So suddenly I'm gone from a a rider to a, a holiday maker to a mechanic. Had you thought that you might be able to break into the racing scene in Europe? It was a, a trip to have a look, uh, to see whether I wanted to go and just ride a bike at, you know, that level. But in hindsight or, you know, after sort of a, a few months or a year or so, I, I realised that uh, at 27, what the guys I was working for over there were doing at 20 with the the backup they had, mm. it wasn't going to happen. And the riders that I used to race against here in Australia, the Jeffrey Sales, the Stuart Avance, I could see where those guys were finishing in races and working out from that point of view where I would probably finish. So you go, it, it's, it's probably not really what you want to do. Well, that shows a bit of maturity and insight for a 27-year-old to, to accept that actually you're probably not you know, it's maybe a bit late and you probably haven't quite got the talent to yeah, to, look, to make it. Yeah, I think it was probably uh, something I'd done. I mean, I, I, I'd i actually um, diversified a bit in sport 
in the late 70s and and as we're talking before I said you know I took up scuba diving Uh, I didn't ever go surfing but uh, you know I was even looking at uh, hang gliding at the time as as a pastime and and nearly got involved in that fortunately I'm very happy to say today that I didn't but (laughs) you know there was there was obviously something there and uh, I'd lost a um, a good friend who I used to travel with in Australia had been killed in a motorcycle accident on the road. So, you know, a few things had changed given the, the longevity I'd been doing it, which wasn't great. You know, it was only sort of nine years or so. And uh, the fact that the age thing was there and there was more to life than sport. There was girlfriends at the time than, you know. So it, the, the trip to Europe in uh, the beginning of 1980 just really cleared a lot of things. And mm. uh, I stayed there. We're working for Randy Mamola, an American writer uh, who was writing for Suzuki Great Britain, 1980, 81 and 82. So, uh, and working with him, winning Grand Prix, uh, breaking lap records, the, you you were still getting a buzz out of, out of the, the success in the team. And the team was only sort of four people. Randy's a really huge name, isn't he? And um, it continues to be a, a, a big name in the sport. He does a lot of media stuff, I think. And, yeah. But, but, he, but he never really cracked it, did he? He, never, he? he was a good rider, but he never made world championships. Or he, he finished second more times than anybody in the world championship. Yeah. There was something about Randy when the pressure really came on, something sort of used to used – to, there was like a switch where – the more the pressure built up, the more he he just went off on a tangent. But, you know, you talk to him today, I think he'd probably be 60 now. Mm. Uh, he achieved, he might not have achieved the ultimate goal, but he did um, win a lot of Grand Prix. He did beat people on their day. Yeah, I don't think he'd, he has any regrets. No, well... Uh, yeah, I didn't mean to be in any way disrespectful <laughs> no, to, uh, no, to no, Randy, but, but such a massive name in the sport. Mm. And, and when I sort of read up his, his statistics and things, I was surprised to see that he hadn't actually been world champion, but had come so close so many times. Yes, yes. He, it, it's one of those stories within a story. Yeah, you know? yeah. Mm. So was that your first experience of the, the Grand Prix circus, if you like? And what, uh, absolutely. And what was that like? Absolutely. It, w- it was very, very difficult because everything was very, very new and there was so much at stake. Uh, and and uh, there, there was sort of pure exhaustion at the end of the day. I mean, in those days, we were doing so much on the bikes. Uh, these days, it's more just fitting of parts. In those days, we were modifying bikes. We were welding. We were, we were you know, I remember in Paul Ricard in France going uh, two nights without any sleep, which just made me realise when I got the reins to control some of these race teams that you don't get your best work when you when people are working those hours. You're better off to work less and come in earlier, get everybody home and then come back early and, and, and have a crack from the morning rather than holding people back late at night. When you still see that in motorsport, from what I observe is that, you know, in the big teams like the supercars, you know, if someone cracks it, trashes their car in qualifying, you know, basically they're in the shed all night yes, putting they, it back together uh, for the race the they, next day. They have no choice. But no. The, you know, with the, with good operation and two two machines, as we always had, the, there are options, there, there are ways of doing things these days. There's more spare parts in the trucks now compared to what there were in the old days. So much has changed. It, it's, um, you know, it was a great 34 years to watch it evolve, but... Yeah. The last years were better than the first years. Even the engines, I gather, these days, they get pretty much delivered, sealed and ready to pop in the bike. Is that right, from, say, Honda or...? Yes, and, of course, there's rule changes that have come in with limitations on engines. There's only, I think, five engines for the season now, whereas only as far back as 2004, with the four-stroke engines, we we had 40 engines in one bike, in in Valentino Rossi's bikes in that championship-winning year. Mm. So that's 40 completely new engines. But going back to the 1980s, we were still racing two-strokes. And um, it was very different then. The two-stroke is easy to maintain at the circuit, in a sense. But the four-stroke, the work required on a four-stroke engine, uh, 
can take 12, 15, 20 hours, probably longer to build to build it up. So we had specific engine crews, uh, and this gets back to what I was saying about getting the people working in the right way, was that uh, when I arrived at Yamaha from Honda in 2004, you would have a situation of the bikes requiring major engine work at night, and the engine would be taken out and given to the engine crew who would then spend six, eight, nine, ten hours, whatever it was, uh, changing cam chains and what have you, and then the other mechanics would be waiting in the garage to refit it. When I arrived there, I told the guys, take the engine out, give it to the engine guys, tell them to put it on the bench and we'll be in two hours early in the morning to put it back in rather than wait six hours. You know, it's just a case of trying to keep everybody as sharp as they can be without wearing out your best people. A lot of the work practices I I, I took on are still adhered to today and it's quite quite interesting to watch and people don't know why they do these things because now it's just the way they've always done them. But somebody had to put them in place in the first place. So that that's a good time to ask the question about, you know, the role of a, a crew chief and what exactly that, that is within a team. So that that's what you're best known for. In fact, you've been called the kingmaker in in uh, one article that I read because uh, because of the success that you've brought to some of the teams and to the riders. So just tell me what, what, what is a crew chief and what, what do you see as the main roles? The, the crew chief's main role is to coordinate with everybody uh, and it's got more involved as the years have gone by. You know, if you went back 30 years, you were like the chief mechanic and you had another mechanic alongside you and you had two Grand Prix bikes and you got through the work pretty well. One was a senior mechanic, one was a guy who was probably just as good but hadn't been there as long. Might have been better but hadn't been there as long, so I just didn't have the title. But as we moved into more diagnostic and more computer control stuff and, and suspensions and... and uh, tyre technologies and what have you, we end up having this support from outside companies with a tyre engineer, uh, a suspension engineer, a data recording guy, a data input guy, a Japanese engineer, three or four mechanics plus the crew chief. Now, the crew chief in my case uh, was always the guy who spoke with the rider, interpreted what the rider he was having, dealt again in the meeting, all these people I've just mentioned were in the meeting, perhaps not the mechanics who would be there in the garage tearing down the bikes, getting ready for the changes that the sharp guys had realised were going to be made, taking gearboxes out perhaps or or suspensions or whatever. But my job was then to coordinate those guys and work out the, wor- the, the work that had to be done and, and to organise it and, and get that message out to the mechanics. The rider would do his debrief, and then he would disappear to do what other duties he had to do, media or God knows what else, depending on how far up the hierarchy he was in terms of demand. And I would uh, then sort of become the the eyes and ears and mouth of the rider. So what he had told me, I had to interpret, understand, and convey to the suspension changes whether it's going to be spring rate, um, wheelbase, front steering position or, or whatever. So it, it uh, uh, the idea was to, to give the rider something that was better the next time he rode it than the, when he just got off it. So that relationship with the rider is obviously a very uh, important one because they have to trust you with the information they're giving to you and you have to kind of read between the lines and interpret some of the stuff that they're telling you maybe does it absolutely that that's exactly what it is and the interesting thing when you go from one rider to the next what was a problem for one rider may not be a problem for the next rider and the way they explain the same problem is completely different. So you, it takes some time, which you build up in the pre-season testing, to actually understand um, how these guys are riding the bike and the way they put pressure on the tyres and, and what they do to actually be able to work coherently with them and, and quickly and, and efficiently. Yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is difficult. And at the same time, you have to understand things like, for example... If the rider had won the Grand Prix on this bike last Sunday, 
and we're here at the next circuit uh, on the first practice on a Friday and he comes in and he says, if this is all we've got, we might as well go home. Uh, you know, you go, well, hang on, you won the Grand Prix on it last week. It's not, can't be that bad, might not be perfect, but, you know, you're in the top five. What, what's going on? But you don't know, and you've got to be careful whether he's dropped half a million dollars on the stock market or he's had a tiff with a girlfriend. So all you've got to do is is sort of keep him on side and saying, okay, mate, we'll look at the data and, and uh, it'll be better this afternoon. And, you know, I would say 99 times out of 100, it was better this, this afternoon without... That much changing. changing. <laughs> well, you've got to change a little bit because you pick that data up yourself yeah. and, in terms of the spring rate and, and uh, what have you, but uh, the tyre wear and, you know, you're always doing something to learn to make a, a, an improvement. And in many cases, uh, you because we return to the same circuits every year, you, you might have anywhere up to uh, 20 years of information on that circuit and probably the last three years of information is probably relevant. So you've got all that data uh, there. A new circuit, of course, you don't, but that's the same for everybody. So uh, all in all, you, you're um, using all the information you've garnered over the, over the last few years in the races and you don't throw that away. All the information you've garnered with the new bike from the start of the season, you don't throw that away. But if things aren't going well, you saw fall back to that sort of information to get some sort of base so that you can then reset and, and move forward. So there's a fair bit of psychology and counselling coming with this job, I'm, I'm sensing, that, uh, <laughs> and maybe being a bit older, uh, as you got older, did you find that a bit easier because, you know, you, you, it, you've been around these guys and, they're, it, it, and they look to you as a maybe a father figure in a way? And Yeah, I mean, with, when I was working with Wayne Gardner in 86, 87, I was the first opportunity to be a crew chief. I'd worked the previous year for Freddie Spencer when he'd won the uh, uh, 250 500 double. I'd worked on his 500 bikes and the sponsorship was from Rothman Cigarettes at the time. And they wanted to enlarge the team to have a, a team structure, two riders and what have you. And the boss at, at Honda rang me at the end of the season and said, uh, we'd like you to uh, head up Wayne Gardner's team. And I said, no, look, Mr. Goomer, I'm very happy working for Freddie Spencer. I get through the work and uh, I work well with Irv Kanemoto, who was a, the, the crew chief. And he uh, said, look, if you don't do what Honda know you can do, you have no further use to Honda. So okay. suddenly I'm in the position of Wayne Gardner's crew chief and I've never told men what to do in my life, I, you know, I've been happy to receive the the uh, instructions from the crew crew chief, and to a degree, reverse engineer what he said, and that would allow me to understand what Freddie had perhaps said to her. If we're putting in a lower gear ratio or something, Freddie must have said, "Oh, the gear is too high," you know. But so I, I was sort of in my own mind, keeping up with what was happening with the bike. But uh, they threw me and Wayne together, and Wayne probably got cop the uh, bad end of the deal because he he was a, a competent rider coming into full season factory bike Grand Prix so it was new to him so they threw us both in mm. at the deep end a bit we got off to a flying start won the first race but it was still difficult for me I would never go to lunch and the mechanics would say oh no you got to come to lunch Toby I said no no I've got too much to do got too much to do and as time went by you you became more comfortable, uh, confident, more understanding that certain things do take care of themselves, other things don't change. There are, you stick to the routine, you, you'll, you'll get through it all. And uh, the following year with Wayne, we, we won the championship. So so world, world championship with Wayne Gardner, then mm. working with Mick Doohan, world championship. Yeah, five, five with Mick. That wasn't, uh, it was good times. Uh, but yes, uh, Honda came to me at the end of 88 and asked me um, to do the same with another Australian, Mick Doohan, that I'd done with Wayne Gardner. So, you know, I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> I mean, I remember those times even as, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I wasn't, certainly wasn't then a huge motorcycle racing 
fanatic, but those two names and then Casey Stoner, of course, mm. later uh, were just massive yes. in Australia and so good for our... Yeah, well, what's the, what's the word for, for our for the national morale? I mean, oh. having guys at that level winning races, it was it must have been great to be involved in that. Absolutely, and it, it made us made Australians. There was motorcyclists in Australia, of course, and <clears throat> there was people interested in racing. But when we, and there'd be many Australians who'd gone overseas in the forties, fifties, sixties who didn't get the uh, the accolades they probably deserved back here. Uh, of course, times were different. We, we did have world champions, uh, but uh, uh, in Wayne's case, when SBS started televising this young Australian doing well in 1986, then Channel 9 stealing the, the program off SBS, you started to realise the commercial value of it. Wayne winning the championship and being the first Australian to win the 500 world title, which is the premier title, was massive. And of course, out of Wayne's efforts, we end up getting a Grand Prix of our own at Phillip Island. So if you put all the pieces together, you know, Wayne Gardner, in my mind, is, uh, you know, eminent in, in getting that, that Grand Prix to Australia. And here we are, um, you know, 32-odd years later with an Australian Grand Prix still. Yeah. Well, and you can... And, and behind that, you know, you had Mick Doohan come along. Casey Stoner couldn't have been anything but influenced by both of those riders who are both Australians, and he goes along and wins two world titles. So out of nothing comes something, and it's massive, you know. And you should feel rightly proud of your, your role in all of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not something I dwell on. I, uh, it was something I did. Um, yeah, it was, I was part of a team, and that was the important thing. And then along comes this bloke, Valentino Rossi, who we both watched the Masano uh, Moto GP race in Italy last night and uh, probably stayed up too late. No, there's no uh, spoiler alert here because by the time this comes to air, the um, <laughs> the results will be out there and everyone who's interested will have watched it. But it was uh, Valentino Rossi's final Italian race last night and there was a lot of media and interest around that. And you were there at the beginning of, of that great man's uh, Moto GP career. Yes, you know, uh, it was... Um a long time ago now, but uh, yeah, yeah, when Mick was injured in uh, 99, third race of the season, and uh, announced his retirement later that year, the Mick was going to run his own team, and uh, I was going to go and work with Mick, and we were going to run Valentino Rossi, but for one reason or another, things didn't happen. I'd recruited some mechanics to do what we had to do, does that mean you stole them from other people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, suddenly that it's not going to happen. And uh, I felt a little bit uh, uncomfortable because um, these guys had families and mortgages and they rang me up quite concerned uh, that um, the thing had folded and where did that leave them? And I quickly thought, well, Honda has signed Valentino Rossi but they don't have any team to run him in. They're going to have to make a team. So I was given the job of making a team with these guys, you know, and we built up for Valentino in his first two years, a team separate to the factory Honda team because Alex Grivier had won the title on the Repsol Hondas and they didn't want Valentino Rossi in the, in the factory team. So we set up our own team with a factory bike in our own little workshop. And for two years, it, it was absolute heaven. We went out, we finished second the first time, first year, and won the championship in 2001, the last of the 500 championships. But, um, yeah, meeting Valentino as a young 19-year-old, 20-year-old kid was was great. He a uh, very quiet young man. And um, I said to our guys, the guys working with me, I said the only way will mess this up is if, if we mess it up. He, he's the guy taking the risk. He's leaving a, an Italian team with Italian mechanics to come to a Japanese team with Australian mechanics. So, you know, we've got to make sure that we dot the I's and cross the T's and look after him. And, uh, you know, we had 13 wonderful years. And, and he agreed to go to Yamaha from Honda, but only if you were the crew chief, is that correct? 
Well, I, I found out in hindsight he, he only agreed to sign at Honda if I was the crew chief. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so I should have asked for more money. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, there's a bit of that stuff you hear. I'm not sure how, no. how serious it is. I was given the brief when Valentino made it clear that he wasn't happy with things at Honda, although we'd won four world titles. I, got, I was given the brief by the top people at Honda Racing Corporation to keep Valentino at at Honda, and that's what I set out to do. I explained to him that, you know, we had the rider, we had the team, we had the bike, we'd proved that we've done it. And he said to me, Jerry, he said, it's more than that. So he felt that he wasn't getting what, and I'm not talking about financial here, but he just felt that he wasn't getting what he thought was the respect from Honda. Honda's attitude was that anybody could win on their bike. And so I, I persevered for pretty much all of the year to keep Valentino at, at Honda. In the end, when he handed back his contract at Mat the Japanese Grand Prix at Matigi to the head of, of Honda Italy, the head of Honda Italy racing department assumed it was signed and then when he looked at it and it wasn't signed, he realised that yeah, uh, Valentino was leaving Honda. And at that point, I I don't know why I did it. I, I said, well, Valentino, I said, if it'll make any difference, I'll come with you. And he and his mate Uccio were just like over the moon. There was this just sort of facial expression that was like, you'd never seen before, I was so happy. And I'm going, well, why did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> so I walked into the garage to where the other mechanics were and I said, I'm going to Yamaha. And Alex Briggs, who's uh, a great mechanic and a, and a great friend of mine, he said, well, JB, if you're going, I'm coming too. I'll learn more over there with you than I will by staying here at Honda. And he would have taken my job at Honda right. for sure. <clears throat> You know, between Japan and Australia, which was an ex-Grand Prix, there was time to talk amongst the mechanics. And uh, we had a clandestine meeting with the Yamaha management in Phillip Island. And I took uh, three mechanics with me who I felt would be the best for the, the job, bearing in mind that Yamaha hadn't won a world title since 1992. I didn't take the best for me. I took the best for what I thought the job would do. We needed to do the job who would be less critical of perhaps the Yamaha product if it wasn't that good and would uh, be tolerant and persevere rather than say, well, at Honda we do it this way or this. So we had to have a bit of diplomacy and I took that group of guys. They all agreed to, to terms with, with uh, Yamaha. I realising perhaps before they did that... Um, you know, we were burning our bridges. There was no going back. But uh, out of all of this, Valentino said to me, what will Honda do? And I said, well, they'll have to bring out everything that they've got, and that's what we've got to make them do. So that we know at the end of 2004, when we get beaten, that they have had to throw everything at us. And I also said that we've got to go at 100%. We can't not go at 100%. And he sort of nodded his head and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yamaha were absolutely fantastic. The bike wasn't very good in the first test. It wasn't as bad as it might have been, but Valentino said a couple of things to me after riding it eight laps or so. And you've got to remember that Valentino had been observing this bike for probably three quarters of 2003. So he, he knew what he was getting on to. And we, uh, he said to me, his words were, Jerry, it's not so bad, but, and that was what I got to learn from Valentino for many years. Whenever he said something, there was always going to be a but. Is that his way of being polite? No, he just said, but he said, I'm locking the brake. I'm locking the front brake. And I said, oh, I said, that's good. And he looked at me with a, a blank sort of stare and he said, I could see him think. And, of course, because it was the first time he'd ridden a the bike, there was 20 or 30 people listening to what he was 
going to say. I said, that's good. And people looked at me and I remember the Japanese engineer, Atsumi, who I worked very closely with uh, for many years after that. I said, the, the Brembo brakes on this bike are the only thing that is common to the, to the Honda and we never lock the brake on the Honda. I said, I said to them that the centre of gravity of the bike is too low. We need to raise the bike 20 millimetre. And we raised the bike, fixed the problem straight away. So we gained confidence within the Yamaha group very quickly. And we got rid of some of the things that they had brought on as rider aids, which were just additions on top of additions without ever taking anything away. So between there and the first race in South Africa, Yamaha, whatever they promised, they delivered. And we tested and we tested and we tested. And we finally got some decent throttle bodies and bits and pieces that we knew we could work in a decent clutch and things like that. And uh, we went to South Africa and Valentino won the first race. And this is after journalists had ridden that bike at the end of the 2003 season saying, Valentino will be lucky to win a race on it. So it was so good. We led every practice session and then we had to lead the race, which was the big test. What a massive confidence boost, boost for a new team and, uh, you know, a great team bonding experience, yeah. I suppose, oh, with, with it, that early success. It, it was. And, of course, the Japanese didn't get too excited because, you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. Their plan was to win the championship in 2005 for the 50 years of Yamaha. Yeah. But, you know, we were on a roll, but we were brought down to earth very quickly at the next race when it was wet. The bike didn't work particularly well in the wet. And I knew myself that towards the end, we would come up against races in the rain during the season and every chance going to Phillip Island in October of that year that we, it would be wet and we may have to race for the championship. Throughout the year, we didn't have one more wet race, but we had wet practice sessions and we were still able to work at the, the problem with the wet in that bike and that engine uh, style of engine delivery which was able to be modified and changed for a, a better delivery in 2005. So we were learning all the year and uh, we did end up winning the championship, which, which was fantastic. So looking back over this long career of sending these incredibly talented riders out on bikes that have been prepared basically under your supervision and under your responsibility, does that weigh heavily on you, you know, that that feeling that this machine is really, you know, it's down to you whether it it uh, works or fails and obviously failure in, in that context is very dangerous for the riders. Was that something that you felt from a day-to-day -day point it, of view? Yes, uh, you, you're always aware and equally so as a mechanic, you know, when everything becomes routine, the mind doesn't always remember that it's done it, you know, so you, you, you know you've tightened the axle nut but because that's what you do. But the rider's on the track and somebody says, did you tighten the axle nut just to wind you up? And you go, of course I did. But there's a lot more bolts than just the axle nut. And uh, I always worked very carefully myself as a mechanic around the wheels and the brakes. If a rider has the bike underneath him, if other things perhaps do go wrong, he still has some element of control, which I think is what you need. If you don't have any control, then you're in the lap of the gods. And that's that's when serious accidents happen. But I think to be a good mechanic, you you, you know, the, the, the old saying, a mechanic in panic is not a mechanic. So you, you can't panic. You've got, to, you've got to get through what has to be done. There are times when you are under extreme pressure, but you can't shortcut. You have to make sure that the machine is safe. Are there checklists that you use for those essential items? Not, not that you'd walk back to a notepad and tick them off and say that that's done, but there's a routine as how a guy would fit a front wheel. He, you know, it wouldn't be that any different to anything else. And if you do that the same way every time, you're not going to forget anything. Uh, I had a, a very uh, firm regulation, more so than a rule, that both motorcycles were prepared the same in terms of how cabling was laid out, how, how uh, I mean, the ergonomics of the bike position on, of levers is controlled by the rider, but where these cables and electric pieces go, bits and pieces go, 
and other things that uh, could go pretty much in several directions always go in the same spot. So one guy can jump from one bike to the other to assist his, his mate, knowing exactly that everything is done the same way. You see how often these guys fall and just the uh, Masano practice number four yesterday, I was watching, they, they were dropping like flies. I think there was at least six of them went off at, at high speeds and lots of talk about cold track and wrong tyres and half the tyre not coming up to temperature and all sorts of stuff that a lot of which was probably over my head. But it's amazing how most of the time the guys stand up and, you know, kick the gravel in disgust and, and walk off the track. But have, have you been involved personally with many serious injuries or even fatalities in your teams? No, I, I haven't, fortunately. But you can often look to the other side of the the paddock and, and, and see perhaps a mechanic or two that's been involved in, in or a team that's had several of these disastrous situations and, and through no fault of their own. I mean, a, a rider can fall and, and uh, in this day and age, it tends more that the riders are being run over by other riders and more so in the smaller classes than in the MotoGP class. I think as the riders get more experience, they become more understanding of the risks. And uh, I know it's something that um, the FIM has changed for next year is that age limits are increasing in the, in the smaller classes because they have seen far too many unfortunate uh, incidents this year. In the younger riders? In the younger or, riders. Yeah, yeah, okay. So they're encouraging the older guys to... Well, uh, they don't want 15, 14, 13 and 14-year-olds uh, racing oh, um, in, in championships and they're controlling the size of the grid to reducing that down. So there's things they're trying to address. It's a little bit uh, perhaps closing the door after the horse has bolted, but something had to be done because the bikes are all so equal. And it's a bit of a bugbear of mine that in this world of motorsport now, which has been channeled into television so that we all sit in our lounge rooms and enjoy it immensely, has actually stuffed up a lot of the racing. You, you have controlled tyres, so everybody has the same, same amount of grip at all circuits, more or less. Uh, in the old days, you would have had two or three tyre brands, teams at the back of the grid with tyre companies that would work well. Some circuits, their tyres would work better than others. But now it's all the same level of tyre, controlled ECU. I don't think it's breaking up the the riding groups, particularly in the, in the lesser classes where the bikes aren't extremely powerful. And there's not that much to bring in to control the horsepower of the bikes because they don't have to. So the kids learn to ride them as fast as they can and they're bumping into each other all the time and weaving in front of their mates and then somebody falls off and there's seven or eight of them together and we have these horrible accidents. Like the like the peloton in the bike, bicycle Absol races that Absolutely. they all go down together. It, it's very much like that. And that's designed for the media to uh, improve the chance of close racing. Exactly. I okay. mean, it, you know, the, the, ra the television spectacle's never been better, but it comes with some things that perhaps have... have attributed to a better spectacle, but perhaps added, added a degree of risk. You know, the fact that a tyre company buys the series for the year gets very little value out of advertising on Monday that we won. But at the end of the season, they, they chalk up another world championship in MotoGP or the, the lesser classes as it is with Dunlop. If you allowed those companies to run in all classes, they may choose not to. But they would also bring money to teams to say, hey, we want to develop tyres for MotoGP, in the early instance, they would have to get some of the lesser teams on their tyres, develop them, probably pay the teams, so more money would come in. So in a situation like that, I see uh, a lot of benefits for having more people involved, but you might have spread out, more spread out racing. I just want to talk a little bit about the the personality types in the in the in the sport and watching Formula One. Grand Prix versus MotoGP, I get a sense that the riders are a pretty laid back bunch of guys compared to the Formula One drivers. They seem a bit more intense, but but I also imagine that they're a bit like 
well, you know, that uh, the, there's different groups of ad- athletes. Actually, I've got a friend who was an, uh, a doctor for the Irish Olympic team, and he used to tell me about the different athletes and their personality types. He said the marathon runners, they're just like the most relate, <laughs> laid back guys, you know, always smiling, relaxed, whereas the 100-metre sprinters were like uh, thoroughbred horses. They couldn't sit still, and they're really type A personality types, very high maintenance, complaining about everything. What, what are the riders like in general? Can you kind of generalise? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would always say Formula One was sort of, as explained to me many years ago, all Reebok and Gucci. Yeah. You know, it's all about style and everything else. The riders were a bit, bit more laid down, like you say, but the best of them are very intelligent men who understand their craft very, very well. And I would say the top three or four are more like like into your hundred meter sprinter, and the rest fall in somewhere behind. I would always expect that at the start of the season, all of the 24 riders believe they're going to be world champions at the end of the year. As the season progresses, it gets down to about 16 who still have the belief. And as the season goes down, you know, we all know, but they sh- they should still believe they can do it. And uh, that should be what they're striving to do. And, and each time they get an opportunity to improve their craft, that's what they should be doing. And, you know, there's an element now in MotoGP that you can lose one ride at one factory and you end up at another because they're effectively all factory bikes on the grid now. If you go back 20 or 30 years, uh, 25 years, you'd get two years on a factory bike. If you didn't deliver, you'd lose it. They'd put somebody else in there. So... The longevity of riders these days is is enormous compared to years gone by. Well, in the cars, though, the Formula One, they seem to change contracts every second year. If they're not uh, performing, they you know they're already sniffing around or getting sought out by another by another group. Yeah, yeah, I think they've got managers who need a better ten percent. Yeah. So you know, there's there's massive things like that. The, the most of the good motor Grand Prix riders. Uh, don't need a manager once they're up to speed with how it all works. But, yeah, it's it's an interesting world. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a comment about Mick Doohan at one stage looking at setting up his own team, which just made me think about how much money must be involved at that level. These, you know, such a tiny fraction of the guys make it to this level and it must be super competitive. Are the rewards as, uh, as enormous as one might imagine? I think if you're in one of the true factory teams like the big manufacturers and out of that I'm talking Yamaha, Honda, Ducati now and and probably Suzuki, you know, there's a lot of money involved in in setting up a team, whether it's worth it in terms of revenue gained through advertising to that company, you never really know. The riders riding for Honda, Yamaha, Ducati are probably paid a lot. You know, they they generally have the, the position of leverage to to buy out a rider from a, another team who looks good. So the riders are always, always looking for one of those three teams you would expect, probably more so Yamaha and, and Honda than even Ducati. Right. Because it's been a long time since Ducati's won the championship. They've been more competitive in the last few years, but it's still Honda and Yamaha that are sharing most of the spoils. I thought they were going to start to win it last night on <laughs> Masano until our two, our two guys fell over on the track. Yeah, it, it's high-pressure stakes in Italy for the Italians. I mean, I always said you can never rely on the Italians in Italy as riders. There, I had to go through an era where we had Max Biaggi, Loris Caparossi and Valentino Rossi riding on for three different manufacturers, all going for, uh, for the prize at Mugello and only one made it and it wasn't Valentino. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, from that moment on, I thought, God, it, it, it means so much not to be third in Italy or second in Italy uh, between Italians. And I can imagine Bagnaia feeling that same pressure last night, uh, A, to keep the championship alive, B, to get more points on uh, Quattararo, who had started from 15th, and the fact that they tested there regularly and he'd won the race there earlier in the season. So, you know... Everything was going his way until five laps from the end. Mm. What well, do you think that you know? If you looked at the top ten riders, could you put them on any of those bikes, and they with with a you know appropriate amount of time to familiarise themselves, they would they would still 
finish in the same sort of order or do you think the bikes at that level play a more important role? Uh, I think it's 80% rider and 20% bike, but that's okay. probably a... <laughs> the figures probably aren't right, but we, we saw Valentino Rossi leaving the Hon- winning Honda in 2003 and beating them on a, on a Yamaha the next year and the year after. Yeah, so, no, I'd, I'd have Valentino Rossi in, the, in his day or a Mick Doohan on a bad bike because right. they have the potential to develop it into a good bike, whereas a, a bad rider can't develop a bad bike. What year did you finish all of this stuff, Jeremy? 2013 was the year I finished working, and uh, Yamaha didn't want me to go anywhere else the following year, so they paid me another year. And uh, I was 60 years of age, so I uh, was 61 by the end of that. So I, I was ready to stop. I had been away for 34 years. It's a young man's sport. If I was to take up another rider at that point, he would have been in his 20s, which means I would have been a grandfather figure. So to, to get that bond working probably wouldn't have happened. I was only ever going to be repeating myself. And, you know, to me, I'd done it. And I'd said that to Valentino. I'd said, uh, you know, I don't want to sell it, say it, sign any more multi-year contracts and he was fine with that initially and then I think he said oh, well if I'm going to change at the end of next year I might as well change now and okay I went out a year early but I wasn't unhappy about it it was uh, I'd read enough sporting biographies to know that you know sportsmen change their coaches towards the end of their careers and it gives them a bit of a spike but really doesn't change too much and I mm. think uh, that's been vindicated uh, with Valentino, but he had to do that. He had to do something because he hadn't done anything since uh, 2009. Do you miss it? Uh, I miss the people. I, I missed it initially probably a little bit more in the beginning. I'd, I had arrangements in place to meet people at Grand Prix in, in America and in Europe the following year, which I, I honoured because I said I'll be there for that race. So. And um, I had some business things to tidy up in Europe, so I went back. Uh, I still watch it every night. It's going to be more difficult to watch it now without Valentino, not not that we've got to see him on television much at all uh, the last year or so, but, you know, he, he for me, it's very, very um, good to see him get out of this sport with his body in, in really, really good shape. That was always important to me. That, so, yeah, I mean, he's had, he's had a wonderful career and he's ready. Uh, I spoke with him at length at uh, Phillip Island 2019 and he, he asked me how old I was when I had my first child and I said, oh, I was 41. And he said, oh, that's good. He says, because my girlfriend uh, wants uh, children and I'll be 41. So, you know, he's already thinking about the future. Yeah. And... Uh, He'll be driving cars and, and he'll be on demand throughout the world for as long as he wants to be. And uh, as an ambassador for Yamaha, they'll be on him all the time, all over the world for events three or four times a year. And it'll take the pressure off the great Giacomo Agostini, who's been doing it for both Yamaha and MV the last few years. So, yeah. Very good. Well, just a final question for you. I mentioned uh, Alan Austin at the start of the of the interview because he, you know, he is my currently my crew chief. But I haven't been completely happy with his performance. Although the pay, uh, I have to admit, is pretty poor. An occasional <laughs> bottle of red wine and a cup of coffee at the track. So that position may be open, JB, if uh, if you're looking for, you know, a bit, you know, back to get back into the high end of motorsport <laughs> uh, down at Malala or the Bend occasionally. So uh, look, I won't say any more, but just mm. keep that in, keep me in mind. Well, yeah, look, I'll, I'll uh, let me know and I'll come out and observe from a distance and yeah. see if I, I want to get involved. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't. <laughs> uh, look, what a great treat to have a, have, have a chat with someone who's got so much experience at the, the highest possible end of motorsport and who has been involved in stuff behind the scenes that I suspect we've barely scratched the surface of. So one day we might just have to have a beer and hear some of the real stories. So thank you, you very much, uh, Jeremy. It's been a really good chat. Richard, thank you very much. It's been great. Well, that's the show for today. Thanks for joining me. If you want any more information, you can check out the podcast website at realriskpodcast.com.